Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wesley Methodist Church Seremban, 25th October 2020 online service. We're so glad that you're able to join us as we celebrate together God's faithfulness in our lives. Let us prepare our hearts as I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Call to worship. With hearts ready to serve, God, God turns, turns our mourning into, into singing and our sorrows into laughter. With hope and expectation, God, God turns our weeping into celebration and our grief into shouts of joy. Come before the Lord with yearning with hearts ready to serve. Let us now pray the opening prayer together. Lord of light and hope, be with us this day as we have gathered to hear your word. Help us open our hearts to the commandments to love even when loving is difficult. Give us the courage to be people who will commit their whole lives in your service. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
we've gathered here today. We've gathered here to pray, hear our cry.
Pray the prayer of confession together. Merciful God, it isn't easy for us to follow the commandments of loving. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God and to love our neighbors. But we have allowed misunderstanding, fear, hatred, and prejudice to cloud our spirits, turning them away from those who need our love. We place a test before you, asking that you prove your love to us or we threaten not to believe in you. Please forgive us for this foolishness and stubbornness. Give us the courage to be people who will care for others. Let us dedicate our lives in your service, always aware of your awesome love for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take some time now for your own personal reflection and confession before God. Pray now.
Now hear this word of assurance. Though our hearts were hardened to the needs of others, God has touched them with God's compassionate care, healing our wounds and giving courage and strength to our souls. Be assured that God's love is poured out for you and rejoice. Amen. This morning, our prayer and intercession. Item 1. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Pray that we will truly love God, not only giving Him lip service, but genuinely loving Him with our entire being. Pray that because we put Him first, our affections, our choices, our thoughts and our actions will glorify Him. Pray now. Item 2. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. Love your neighbour as yourself. We first learn to love ourselves and others in family relationships. Pray that family members will build each other up with love. Pray that those who have been emotionally hurt by their families will find healing. Pray that families will go on to be a blessing to others, sharing God's love with them. Pray now. Item 3. Last week, 1,292 areas in Selangor were affected by unscheduled disruption in their water supply. Pray that we will not take this renewable resource for granted. Pray for good laws to be made and enforced to curb water pollution and clean up our rivers. Pray that individuals, corporations and the government will each do their part to take care of the environment and maintain good water quality. Pray now. Item 4. Pray for Nigeria. In early October, a video purportedly showing Nigerian police shooting a man being circulating sparked weeks of protests against police brutality. The use of force against protesters have caused 56 deaths. Pray for law enforcement not to use unwarranted violence against citizens. Pray against corruption in the Nigerian government and for change and transformation in this nation. Pray now. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the strength of our hearts. We want to hold on to you forever. We worship you and we adore you. We lift your name up high. Your love knows no bound. You are indeed perfect love. So teach us to love you with our entire being. We want to put Jesus first in all the things that we do. Help us to honour and glorify Jesus' name. We give you thanks, Lord, that you are with us during this COVID-19 pandemic season. With so much uncertainty and disruption to our life routine, 
we draw on to you for comfort and assurance. Do not abandon us, but pick us up in your gentle ways and help us go through this turbulent time with hope and dignity. We trust in your promises and we hold on to your words that you will deliver us from our enemy. We pray for those who are emotionally hurt that they will be able to find healing by learning to let go of bitterness and release forgiveness. We pray that our families will be a blessing to one another and be willing to share God's love with others. Lord, help us to be good stewards of our resources. Teach us not to take our environment and planet for granted. We pray that individuals, corporations and governments will each do their part to take care of our country in order to have sustainable good air and water quality. We pray that irresponsible people involved in polluting our rivers will be brought to justice and face the consequences of their actions. Finally, we pray for Nigeria where violence has erupted against protesters of police brutality. We pray that law enforcement will exercise restraint and not use unwarranted force against its own citizens. We pray against corruption in the Nigerian government. We pray for your hand to be at work to bring about good change that will bring benefit and transformation to this nation. May its citizens enjoy a better future of peace, prosperity and freedom. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 34 to 46, and Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 1 to 12. Matthew, chapter 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him the question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophet. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Deuteronomy chapter 34 Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, Basfa as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zohar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed, and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him, for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants, and to all his land, 
and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. For this the word of God. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you for your word that has been read to us. And even now we pray that you would speak to our hearts, taking your words and putting them to the use for which you have sent it, so that they will not return to you empty-handed. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. What comes to your mind when the word love is said? Perhaps we would feel something, or we would think of someone, or perhaps think of an action which expresses love. At our church camp two years ago, those who led the children's program asked the children what love is. Let me share with you some of their answers. Jesus cares for us. Kindness. Love is when someone takes care of you. Love is giving kisses. Love is when you like something. Love is when you show a love sign. Or oh, I think it's like this nowadays. Love is to take care of what your parents give. Jesus loves us. Jesus protects and helps us. Jesus died on the cross for us. Parents love us. Parents help us study and do homework. And in many instances, love is seen to be expressed in concrete terms. And we all know something about love right from when we are young. And that is because God made us for love. You and I, every human being is made with the capacity and it's a huge capacity to receive love and then in turn to give love. We were made to receive love from God first. And then out of that, out of having received that love, to love God back and to extend that love to others. Now, the two greatest commandments that were read in the Matthew text today are familiar to us. Love God with all our being and love our neighbour as ourselves. At the same time, we recognise that or we think perhaps that it is easier said than done. Let's take a look at the passage. Now in Matthew, the background to Jesus saying these two commandments comes in the final week of Jesus in Jerusalem before he goes to the cross. The Jewish leaders were all out to find ways and means to incriminate Jesus so that they could get rid of him. The Pharisees had first sent their disciples together with the Herodians, if you remember last week, to ask the question about paying taxes to Caesar. They failed to trap Jesus. Then the Sadducees came asking about the resurrection, something which they did not really believe in, and they could not trap him either. Now the Pharisees stepped up to test Jesus. Unlike the Sadducees, the Pharisees were going to test Jesus on something they themselves knew well and believed in deeply, the law. The Pharisees knew the law well because they were earnest and they were serious 
in giving obedience to the law. What is the greatest commandment in the law? They asked Jesus. When we consider that the Jewish law had 316 commandments, plus a lot of the bylaws and the regulations and the rules that over time these people had added to the law. How would you pick the great commandments, the great one, especially if, like the Pharisees, you considered all of them important and had to be followed to the letter? It is only when we know the heart of God that we will know which commandments go to the heart of the matter. It is only when we have a relationship with God and see life as God sees that we shall be able to understand the purpose of the law and to see the overall picture and thus, although the two commandments were in different places, one in Deuteronomy and one in Leviticus, Jesus brought them together, loving God and loving neighbour. They are really two sides of the same coin, relationship with God, relationship with others. This was no academic or intellectual exercise for Jesus. He lived those two commandments. The commandments were given so that people could live in right relationship with God. And that is why the Ten Commandments begin with, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. God's people were called to know this God who had shown such grace in rescuing them from the bondage of slavery. That comes first above all, know the Lord your God. But the Pharisees were caught up, so caught up with the mechanics of obedience to the letter of the law that they lost sight of this relationship and instead focused on every letter of the law and following that. God's invitation to us, God's first call to all of us, is to know God through Jesus Christ and then obedience flows from that relationship. And that is why the Pharisees were unable to answer Jesus' question about the Messiah. They were not relating to God at all. It was unthinkable really when you look at what was said, unthinkable for someone to call a descendant Lord. And yet in the scriptures, and Jesus quotes from Psalm 110, that is precisely what David calls the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He is called son of David, yes, because he is a descendant of David. The Pharisees knew the law of Moses, but they could not recognize the Messiah of whom Moses spoke because they had locked themselves up in their own understanding of who the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would do. They read Moses, but they did not, it seemed, take on Moses' life with God, nor did they follow Moses' example. Let's take a look at Moses' life. In Moses, we see someone who began with knowing about God, 
and growing to maturity in such intimacy with God that God could say this of him. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of God. Speaking mouth to mouth is a metaphor for a real intimacy with God. Moses spent the first few years of his life being brought up by his own mother, even though he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. And many of us know that story from Exodus chapter 1. Moses' mother would have told him the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how God had brought their people to Egypt. But Moses did not know God personally, not until he met God in the burning bush in the desert. And when he was weaned, he was taken to live in Pharaoh's court. There he thought he could save his people his way by using strength and might, killing the Egyptian who was torturing the Hebrew slave. But that was not God's plan. And Moses was just one man. What could he do? Probably he never thought of that. So Moses had to flee for his life. That experience must have been so traumatic that it left him, it left his ego in shreds, stuttering in his speech. The 40 years in the desert stripped him of any pretensions of being a savior of any sort. And it was only when he had reached the end of his rope that the Lord, that Yahweh, could begin to work on Moses to shape him to become the leader that he needed to be, to bring God's people out of Egypt. By then, Moses was a reluctant leader. He realized that he just could not. But then we see him after taking that first step of obedience to go as God directed him. And over time, if we read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, as he obeyed the Lord, Moses grew in confidence, not in his own ability, but in the Lord's leading, in the Lord's presence, in what the Lord will give him instructions to do. Moses had come to know the Lord so well that he could speak for the Lord and even argue with the Lord for the sake of the people. And even though Moses had to carry this heavy burden of a grumbling, cantankerous, disobedient and rebellious people, he came to care for them and perhaps love them. And so Moses in Deuteronomy took painstaking care to walk them through the law, to give them the warnings and finally, after all the teaching, towards the end of his life, to bless them. I suspect Moses could do all of that only because he loved the Lord. He had grown so close to the Lord that he loved God and out of that love was able to care for God's people. Moses was under no illusion about the people of Israel. He had hurt them, he had dealt with them, he had to carry them as it were. 
And so he was under no illusion either about how they would act and live after he was gone. Yet he still took that time and made the effort to teach them, to warn them and to bless them. And so Moses departed. He impacted the life of the people so much that they mourned his going away. And in turn, we also see his impact on Joshua and his and on Joshua's leadership of Israel after Moses. Both Moses and Joshua's roles as leaders of God's people were different. Moses was called to bring the law from God to the people and to a large extent to be God's person to shape Israel as a nation. Joshua was called to lead the people into the promised land and to conquer it. Nevertheless, we see Joshua learning from Moses how to follow God and to be obedient to God. Moses is an example of someone who grew to know God deeply and love God in such an intimate way. Jesus came to make this possible for us. Jesus came to make the way for us to have access to God in a personal relationship with him. And it is only through Jesus that we can approach God and know God personally and come to an intimate relationship with God. We see the Pharisees interacting with Jesus. They saw him, they heard him, or they listened to him. Whether they actually heard what he was saying is up for debate and it always looks as if they never did. Although they saw and listened to Jesus, they could not recognize him as God's anointed one, someone for whom they actually longed. We have come to see Jesus as our saviour. Many of us acknowledge him as our Lord. My concern is whether we interact with him, at least not in the way that will open us to grow in intimacy with him and with God. When our prayers are more a list of requests or simply telling God or telling Jesus our difficulties or reporting what we did today, then the relationship doesn't get very far. A relationship needs a two-way communication. And you and I are invited not just to tell God things or even just to listen, but to be attentive to Jesus, attentive to God and to communicate with him. If we are serious about following Jesus, becoming his disciples, then you and I are called to make time to spend with Jesus, just like Moses took time to be with God, conversing with him as a friend. And when we grow in our relationship with Jesus and with God the Father, we will find ourselves learning to love others. How difficult or how easy it is to love others. I'm often reminded of a Peanuts comic strip. Lucy and her little brother Linus are in the scene. Lucy is skipping and she says, You, a doctor? Ha! That's a big laugh. You could never be a doctor. You know why? Because you don't love mankind. That's why. And the last frame focuses on Linus 
looking away and say, at, out at the screen at Lucy and saying, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. How many of us feel that way sometimes? It's easy, isn't it, to look at the general population, at people in general and say, I love you. But it gets harder when it is a specific person, when there is a face to it. Perhaps our next door neighbour who irritates us or the colleague who takes things from our table without asking us or the lady down the road who pries into our affairs. It is only God's love that can help us connect with people, with these people and to care for them. On our own, you and I will never be able to do it. Our church's mission, does anybody know what that is? Loving God, touching lives. And it is based on these two great commandments. How then shall we go about our mission? We begin with each other in this faith community. Of course, we have spent time with God, we draw near to God, and then we begin with our own community. And John puts it this way in his first letter. He who does not love his brother and sister, might I add, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Jesus also gave us this new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. In this way, all other people will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. In this pandemic season, how have we reached out to those within our faith community? How have we connected first with people in our small groups? How have we then reached out to members who have no access to the online worship service? Some don't. There are those in our community who live alone. A call to them would let them know that they are not alone. Hospitality begins within our own community. The early Methodists were put into small groups called classes and bands and the purpose was to watch over one another in love. These groups were not groups to bring in new people into the society or the church as such, but these groups were discipleship groups. Watching over one another in love meant that each person in the group would be held accountable by the rest for how they were growing in faith and growing in love because that is what really matters for our life. This kind of caring can only come about when there is mutual accountability, when each person in the group knows that he or she is loved and that they are being held accountable out of love for them, not anything else. And there is a safe space for them to share without being judged or condemned, but that their fellow group members come alongside them when they need help to deal with a sin or deal with a failure. Then together, we look outwards to those in the larger community, our colleagues in the workplace, those who live around us or along our street, the stall owners to whom we go at the market, the cashier at the supermarket. In what ways are we showing them hospitality and care? The Methodists 
The early Methodists cared for others so much so that they built orphanages and schools. They made sure that children who were, had to labour six days out of the week on Sunday, they would be able to learn to read and write and count. They set up clinics, they organised social work to help the poor, they ministered to those in the prison and visited the sick. Today, we have an organisation, we have various Methodist organisations like the Methodist Crisis Relief Development Agency at the general conference level. We have individual churches opening dialysis centres, uh, street feeding programmes and such. And these have reached out to many with provision of food, with uh, personal protection equipment for frontline healthcare personnel and other needs, they've met other needs. How may we in our own sphere here care for those around us? We begin by first praying, asking God to open our eyes or if there is already a need right in front of us, we don't need for God to open our eyes. We just need to go and give them the care they need. And then we begin by praying and we also pray for the people with whom we interact and allow God to show us how to care for them beyond meeting their physical needs. And so we have the two commandments, love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And you notice that Jesus changes it from the Old Testament, which says, with all our might, because our mind gets involved in this as well. The thing is these two come and love our neighbor as ourselves. The thing with these two commandments are that they are so familiar that we run the risk of becoming numb to them. Or conversely, they seem so hard that we do not want to make that effort to live them. But if these commandments were beyond our reach to obey, God who loves us in Jesus Christ would never have given them to us. Love God with all our being. Love God, love your neighbour as yourself. God gives them to us not to test us as the Pharisees tested Jesus, but because they really are the very foundation of our lives if we are to follow Jesus Christ, because this is how Jesus himself lived. So they are not in one sense simply commandments to be obeyed blindly. They are given to us in God's grace for our life as the way to live our lives in loving God, loving neighbour and touching their lives. And we don't go this alone. We always need to remember to come back to community and not just our own community here today, we have the cloud of witnesses, people who have lived this life before us. We have people like Moses as an example, and we have Jesus himself who show us how to live these commandments. And best of all, as John Wesley says, God is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And so let me invite us today to ask God for the grace to be able to live these two commandments out. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, you have given us these commandments because 
they are our very life itself. And so today we ask you for grace to help us to live these commandments, to love you even as you love us, and to then extend that love to others around us. We thank you for your word to us. And above all, we thank you for your love for us and for your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The key verses this morning are the two commandments. Let us say them together. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Our hymn of response, My Jesus, I love thee. Welcome everyone to this online service. May I invite each of you, those of you who are worshipping with someone, to turn to each other and welcome one another in the Lord this morning and to say God bless you in ways that are appropriate for this season of physical distancing. Let me just share with you a couple of uh, announcements and concerns of the church. As we are online, uh, doing this online service today, uh, we will not be able to give our offering as usual. And so I would encourage us, if you have the facility, 
to do online banking of your offering and of your pledges to the church. The bank account number is in the bulletin, so please take note of that. Uh, parents who would like to have their children baptized on Christmas Day, and this is subject to whether we will have an in-person uh, worship service on Christmas Day or not. If we do, there will be baptism. And so if you would like to have your child baptized, please get in touch with the office, get a form to fill in, and let us have a copy of the child's birth certificate and then make an appointment to see me about the baptism. We are so glad for all of you to join us this morning in this worship service. Having heard God's word, let us now make our commitment to God, our hymn of commitment where love and charity prevail. benediction. God's love sends us forth into the world in ministries of peace and justice. We have received forgiveness and been showered with God's gracious love. So go in peace to bring hope to this hurting and angry world. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us and all our loved ones, now and always. Amen. Amen.